Hi, everyone. I see we got a few more people joining here. Um, welcome to the uh, Casey's Prep Playbook Livability Strategy Session number two. We are going to wait another couple minutes uh, before we start, give everyone a, a minute to join here. But we do have a lot of information to cover, so we'll get started pretty quickly after 3.30. Hello, everyone. We got a few more people joining. We'll give them another minute or so, and then we'll get started on our Casey Spirit Playbook Livability Strategy Session number two. All right, it looks like we got 30 people, a nice round number uh, to start. There's a few more people joining uh, as they move their way through the Zoom dialogues as we all do, uh, trying to get onto the meeting, but I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, we got a lot of information uh, to cover, a lot of questions for you all to, to help answer uh, for this process. So we'll go ahead and get started. I am Jay Aber. I'm with the uh, engineering planning consultant firm WSP. We are helping the city uh, with the Casey Spirit playbook process. Uh, the city staff was not able to join us today, so you all are stuck with uh, our consultant team, uh, myself, Bill Michael, and Travis Pendleton. Um, we will be uh, facilitating the meeting today uh, and gathering feedback from you. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we are on Zoom. I assume it's the first time you all have used Zoom in the last two years. Uh, maybe not, maybe you're pros, uh, maybe more, more of the latter most likely, but I uh, wanna encourage dialogue. Uh, we're really here to listen to you all, to get your feedback. Um, so at any time throughout the meeting, feel free to enter information into the chat, into comments in the chat. Uh, make sure when you do that, if you uh, select uh, above where you put the message, you can select to send a message just the hosts and panelists. If you do that, then only the consultant team here will see what you say. If you check the selection for everyone, then all the rest of the meeting attendees uh, can see what you say. And um, you can feel free to do either one, but we like to have an open dialogue here. So um, if you want the other meeting attendees to see what you're saying, uh, please select that everyone item. Also, if you wanna talk, um, we'll have opportunities where you can talk. Uh, if you hit the raise hand button at the bottom there, um, we can uh, allow you to unmute and talk uh, in the meeting uh, for some more feedback. Uh, there is a question and answer box as well. Uh, we'd love it if you all would keep your comments to the chat box. Um, the question and answer box isn't something we'll be monitoring throughout the meeting. Uh, and then we'll also have uh, some other ways to engage as well. Jay, before we get going, Marley has her hand up. Yeah, Marley, let me... Uh, I have made it so you can unmute yourself. That was a mistake. I was experimenting. <laughs> okay. Well, we figured it out. Now, now Thanks, we've done Marley. our test case. <laughs> Thanks, Marley. <laughs> Go to the next slide, please. There we go. Um, so, like I said, we have other ways that we're going to engage. Uh, Mintimeter is a, a tool we've been using in the last several strategy sessions. Um, it, it is uh, a separate website. You can get to your phone uh, or through your web browser that Travis will explain in a few minutes. Um, but uh, it's a great way to get your input in. If you are unable to use it, please feel free to put your comments in the chat as well. We'll make sure those get uh, copied over to the Mintimeter selection. 
So today's meeting uh, is livability. This is the second strategy session for livability. Uh, I see a lot of familiar names in the uh, attendee list here. So I think a lot of you have been to our first one. Uh, this is really getting a little bit more detailed than what we did in the first meeting, which was much higher level uh, visioning and goals. Uh, this is more to the details. Um, so essentially, helping us move towards drafting uh, the goals, uh, the objectives, and the action steps for the Casey Spirit Playbook as they relate to livability, um, and really just getting your feedback on how to make uh, Kansas City better, especially at the neighborhood level um, with uh, improving livability. Uh, and then we'll talk about next steps as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Javis. Thanks, Jen. This meeting, just like a lot of the ones previously, we're going to use Mentimeter as we noted. And Mentimeter can be accessed. If you have a smartphone, you can hold your phone up to the QR code that shows on the left-hand side of my screen. You can scan that. You can also type menti.com plus the code, which is over here in the, also in the left-hand side of my screen, which is 70754214. You can go there and it'll take you to where the slides are. Maddie Onofrio is in our office. She's also with Vireo. She's going to be watching the Mentimeter. She's also our backup in case anything crazy happens with internet connectivity and things like that. But Maddie is also going to put a link in the chat to this Mentimeter presentation so that you can click that if it's easier for you. When you do that, it will open up another window. And you'll be able to see the slides. And most importantly, you'll be able to see the ways that you can comment with Mentimeter during the presentation. Also, if it's hard for you to use Mentimeter for whatever reason, don't worry about it. It's OK. You can still use the Zoom chat. And so the responses that we're collecting via Mentimeter, you can put those in the chat if you want. We'll grab those and then incorporate those into Mentimeter. There will also be times if you need to, you can raise your hand and um, let us hear your voice once you're unmuted and we'll take notes on what you say and get that into the Mentimeter. Hey, Travis, I see Danielle uh, made a comment the code doesn't work. I did just try to verify that. It does look like that code's not working. So I think maybe uh, if we get the direct link or maybe the next screen will show the actual updated code that might have been an out of date code on there. Therese, you're on mute. We'll make sure we get the right code and reshare the presentation so we can get your feedback. Always fun with uh, our ongoing virtual uh, pandemic uh, engagement and the fun technology we get to use when we can't just talk face to face. Okay, so I've just put the code in there. That should be the new code, you, should, you can use that. It's also gonna show at the top of my screen when I begin to reshare. And it'll be there for every slide that we have a question that we're asking you all. And I'm sorry, I'm downtown, I'm by the window and I think a large truck is running down the street. So I'm sorry if you can hear some of that. Let me go and reshare my screen with you. And I did just double check. It looks like that code is working. So if you all put that, 9172-9052 in Minty, then it should bring you up to the survey. And it's currently appearing at the top of the screen in case you ever need that. There could be some people that are just joining us. We now have over 50 people and they're starting to respond to our first question, which is where do you live or work? We'd love to know where people are. We have these meetings. We're talking about either north of the river, somewhere between the river and 63rd Street or south of 63rd Street. I can tell how many people have responded by looking at the bottom right of my screen and I can see about 20 of you all have responded and climbing. So far, a lot of you live or work in the center of the city. Some south, few north. We're getting some responses in the chat as well. Some of those are north and central city, some south. Maddie in our office will grab that and make sure that gets counted in the Mentimeter. Give you a couple more seconds to do that. Anytime that um, we ask a question in Mentimeter today, just like with any other previous meetings, 
when we move questions and you're still responding, um, that's okay, you can keep responding and then you'll be uh, prompted to hit a blue button on your screen and that'll take you to the slide that we're on. So almost 40 of you have responded and then there's some responses in the chat. And so I'm gonna take those responses for right now, just for time and ask you another question. We'd love to know if this is your first playbook strategy session. That's our next Mentimeter question. Getting some faster responses on that. Most of you, this is not yours, but some it is and welcome. We'd love to have you here. We wanna have more people. These meetings are recorded. And so once we post the recording on the playbook website, um, you can review what we've been sharing, what we've been hearing 24 seven. But for right now, we've got nine new people and 28 who've been here before, no unsure, so that's really cool. Almost 40 people have voted again. We'll see some comment in the chat. The people in the chat, they're not new either. Let me ask you one more question. We'd love to know which strategy sessions you've been to if you haven't been to them. So far, the playbook has four categories of strategy sessions. We started off with visibility, then start to fold in mobility. We're doing livability and serviceability right now, particularly this week. Serviceability is on Thursday. Which of these have you attended? Looks like mobility and livability are almost neck and neck. Oh, we have a very well-seasoned group here. You guys are professionals at these. You're probably tired of hearing us talk about the same stuff over and over, aren't you? <laughs> Think, oh, they're going to go through the Zoom housekeeping again, aren't they? Got to do it. There always be new people. That's right. It's good to see that we have a few new people here for this meeting, at least. OK, a pretty good distribution. And again, we almost have 40 of you all responding and then some responding in the chat. And someone's commenting, there's been a lot of meetings. Not sure which of these she's been and I totally hear you. We've had a lot of meetings. Okay, while you're, a couple of people might still be responding to that. What I'd love to get into for the moment is what we talked about at our session for livability last month. Last month, we asked some big picture questions that had to do with what your vision for livability in Kansas City might be. And the way that we tackled that was by asking the questions that are on screen. So what makes a great neighborhood? How would you make sure you've got numerous community assets? How do you make sure it's connected? What type of enhanced services and infrastructure are important? How do you make sure development is affordable, diverse, and equitable? How do we eliminate disparities? What additional questions do you have? We got lots of great feedback last time. I think one of the big takeaways is that for a lot of you, livability had to do with the people, like really the people who lives there. Do you have friendly neighbors? What are the connections between people and the neighborhood? And the, having those connections makes really great and strong neighborhoods, as well as uh, feedback about neighborhood livability, meaning safety and walkable and clean and being diverse. Also having access to amenities that are nearby. Sometimes we use the term amenities and community assets interchangeably. There were comments last time about accessibility in all its forms being central to livability. And so when we're talking about all its forms, we're talking about affordable housing, your transportation options, services, your amenities like grocery, arts, culture, those types of things, as well as having a healthy natural environment and preserving neighborhood character. When we started to get into some of these uh, particular topics like services and development and community assets and how do we make sure we have all of those, you all had some really great feedback. A lot, I think all of the feedback that we got from you all is summarized online in a very lengthy document. What I'm sharing with you right now is just some of the big picture things. One of the comments that we heard about livability had to do with making sure that we intentionally engage residents and that when we're talking about assets that we map those and we make sure people have equitable access to them. Um, there were also comments about um, making sure we've got great services and that those services also incorporate new types of services. Like for example, there's a lot of comment in the chat last time about composting and making um, a more robust recycling program. There were comments about street sweeping and some more things. 
Also making sure that we address disparities, fill in the gaps financially where there are challenges, address those and then prioritize areas of need and many, many other comments you all shared with us. Today, what we wanna do is dig into that some more and, and really get to how do we make some of the big picture things that you all were sharing with us a reality. And we're gonna to try to talk to you about that with four concept um, char characterizations. The first one is strong and desirable neighborhoods. The second one is going to be connected city. I'll talk about those two. Jay will talk about the um, community assets or amenities and then get into infrastructure and city services with you all. And then Bill will finish up with housing affordability, quality, diversity, and then eliminating disparities when we're talking about those topics. So this is going to be one of the first times that with you all, we use a different way, a little bit of using Mentimeter. So we're gonna talk right now about strong and desirable neighborhoods. I'm gonna share a couple of things with you all, what it might mean if we're doing strong, desirable neighborhoods and trying to make sure we have that. You're gonna see on your screen, there are some thumbs up, thumbs down and question marks. For each of these topics, as we introduce what they may mean, we wanna know if you're, what you feel generally about those ideas that you're gonna see on screen. So do you have a thumbs up feeling about them that's more positive or do you have some negativity when you look at those or you have some question marks, maybe you're unsure. We'd love to get your reactions to what we're sharing with you. So when we talk about ensuring neighborhoods are strong and desirable, what it might mean, one of the things that we think is that based on you all's feedback before, knowledge of the city, our professional knowledge as a team, all putting all of that together, we come up with the idea that maybe designing public spaces that encourage social interactions and encouraging people to experience and interact with their neighborhood in a variety of different ways. It could be because there are events, it could be because there are new pathways. That's going to be something that um, would help ensure neighborhoods are strong and desirable. Also increasing the number of amenities and those social experiences that you have within a neighborhood. That could mean that we need to really take a closer look at our land use policies and see if there are certain amendments that need to be made. Maybe there are new uses that we need to encourage. A unique neighborhood identity is really important. Every There are 240 neighborhoods in Kansas City. They all have different characters. Um, many of them have definite unique identities and those could be reinforced and strengthened. So you might need to dig into that some more. We may also need to start looking at what it means to um, really look at our streets and how they're designed and what they're used for. So some neighborhoods, for example, maybe they have, let's say they have events or something and um, on those events, maybe occasionally that neighborhood street isn't just used to carry cars back and forth to people's homes and to shops, but maybe a street closes for an event. And so we take a different look at what's needed in that neighborhood um, and maybe that might affect some of the streets and what they're designed for. We might also need to change our approach to how we provide safety within our neighborhoods to make them strong and desirable. In the last meeting, you all were talking a lot about community policing and how do we address that. And there could be some other ideas about what this means. So broadly, we've got some thumbs up, we've got 13, 14 thumbs up, no thumbs down, no question marks. Got a couple of question marks now, that's good. If you have kind of a question mark, that's really good, keep that in mind because there could be other things that we need to be thinking about and we wanna be able to capture that. And so there's gonna be an opportunity for you to dig into that in a bit. And here is a precursor to that. I just shared a bunch of things with you in terms of what it might mean. We'd love to know from you all, which three you think are the most important for strong and desirable neighborhoods. And because those are really wordy, we try to condense them down. So as you're looking at this, which three would make a neighborhood strong and desirable? Is it the social interaction component? You've got to vote for that so far. It could be the, maybe it's more amenities and social offerings. So not just ways to interact, but also the things that you can go to and experience. Might be the land use policies and making amendments. It could be the one about unique neighborhood identities. We have the purpose of neighborhood streets and their design. It could be how safety is provided or it could be some other idea. So right now we've got land use policies and amendments leading the way with 21 of you all voting. 
followed by more amenities and social offerings, which is tied with the purpose of neighborhood streets and design. Usually uh, there's six, almost 60 of y'all here, usually about half of you vote in the previous one, there were about 40. So I'm hoping that we can get to that number again as you all look at this. Any, and you can also um, comment in the chat if you need to. I know that um, in the chat, Marcus has said other for him means, uh, well, he's got his three were um, involved other land use and amenities. Anyone else that mentioned other, we're going to be asking you how you want to tackle that in a bit. So be thinking towards that. Some other great comments, some other comments in the chat. Some desire to talk about development and context. Okay, a lot of these, with almost 40 of you all, are on land use, 23 with a close two and three for the amenity social offerings and then the purpose of neighborhood streets and design, okay? I'm gonna share something else with you all. So over the years, we've gotten different examples of what it means to improve neighborhood strength and desirability. And you all may have some other ideas in your mind. This is just a sample listing. We've got employment and job training, improved energy efficiency, the use of public funds, um, establishing partnerships. A great example of that is the green impact zone, um, which was in effect for several years. It had all four of those things in it. If you look at the top four bullets, but there are other ways of improving and strengthening neighborhoods. Um, you can do it through vacant lot acquisition and transfer. Many of you have heard of the Land Bank of Kansas City. That's an organization that helps do that. They often partner with neighborhoods to do that. Sometimes that also gets into housing development when you coordinate um, with Land Bank. We've got neighborhood cleanups. There have been advisory councils. There have been homeowner assistance programs over the years to help strengthen neighborhoods and to help homeowners. Um, if you're thinking about maybe more of the cultural aspect, we have plans that have been implemented over the years that focus on art access and increasing that, particularly in our neighborhoods and around the city. There have been a lot of different ways we try to do that, but there are still others. And so here is the time. We would like to know from you all, here is again that consolidated list. You just voted on this list. When you were thinking about this, about what your priorities might be, we wanna know how do we make what you're thinking about happen? And the way we would love for you to answer this, this is again a Mentimeter. We want you to share with us, not just um, say, hey, you should do this, but tell us which one of these items that you're focusing on. So if you have an other, please write your other, but tell us what that other is and then how you want to go about making that priority happen. If you're thinking about land use policies and amendments, um, be sure that you put you know, land use and then tell us how you wanna make that happen. Just to give us an idea so that when we go through and sort through all of these comments, that we know what they're supposed to relate to. And if any of you all wanna uh, unmute and, and say some uh, remarks out loud, Put your hand up, raise your hand, use the raise hand feature and we can unmute you and you can say, uh, would you like to, let everyone know. Mm -hmm. We definitely want to hear right now. I see other has to, one of the others has to do with reducing litter and mobilizing teams to pick up the trash. We've got to start with high quality, well-maintained public space on here for land use, follow the area plans. We heard a lot about doing that in last month's meeting. Another for other is the stability for residents through rent control, okay. We've got a safety on here and it's about making non-car travel inviting to Kansas Cityans, making our city walkable, bikeable and safe. There are a few areas in this town to actually not have a car to travel. Again, comment about the area plans and respecting those, not just staff but also officials and following that plan. I know a lot of people worked on those plans. If you're commenting in the chat, we are grabbing that content out and it's showing up on screen. 
um, providing neighborhoods close to auto traffic with nearby mobility hubs that will assist in providing safety, social interaction, unique neighborhood identities and land use. Okay, we've got a comment about streamlining the planning process. It has to do with the land use and policy amendments. Got one about organized neighborhood groups so that they have input in land use. If anyone is commenting and you want to elaborate on your comments, please raise your hand so we can hear your voice and also learn more about some of your thoughts behind your comments so we can capture that and understand your perspective. I see it also in the chat, we've got citizen-based planning and that will make its way on screen. A lot of these have to do with land use and policies. Um, street design was something else that you all had as among your top three. But again, uh, we have all of the answer options on the screen. So any of your priorities that were important to you, we wanna know how, we, how you would like to make sure that those happen. So be sure and um, comment with us. Lots about the area plans. Here's one about social interaction because it can make a strong sense of local community to get people that live there to care about the area they live in and make it better. The comment related to safety and having cameras at various major intersections to help assist with crime. Comment about related to land use, which is there being too many bailout and windfalls for developers. And then we have unique neighborhood identities. We need to engage with neighbor, uh, neighborhood residents to learn what exactly their neighborhood, what makes their neighborhood unique and then facilitate and help them. The comment in the chat about maintaining and replacing existing infrastructure like the broken curbs or sidewalks. Um, those things that are in disrepair send a negative message. We need to work on that. And then there's a comment about shrinking roads to slow traffic. A comment about having a marketing brochure. And then I, what else do we have? Safe, walkable, litter-free, vibrant, and diverse neighborhoods. The way that we could tackle that in relationship to safety. The comment in the chat about needing better bus service. More comments about policy and land use, asking for regular meetings with city council to be proactive. Jay or Bill, do you see anything, anyone with their hand raised? Nope, not yet, but we're still waiting, we're, we're ready. Okay, now we're starting to see some street design comments and some comments about having more amenities because they, those will make developers, uh, more amenities make developers add um, to green space with each development. So you're getting enhancements there. Comment about having public bathrooms if we wanna have more amenities. Okay. We have five topics more to cover with you all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if you're still commenting on this one, you can, but I'm gonna to go to the next topic. If you're still typing, it's okay. You'll be able to catch me because Mentimeter will cue you with a blue button that says to press here to go to the next slide, which is where I'm going right now. This is Connected City. You know, last time we talked about this and we talked about it in terms of the physical connections, like how you travel, what you can see in terms of hardscape, but also culturally, and socially, and I'm sorry, the police are going down the street right now. Okay, when we think about um, what it means to have a connected neighborhood physically, socially, and culturally, that may mean some of the things that you see on screen. Again, here in Mentimeter, you can thumbs up, you can thumbs down, you can question mark what you're seeing here. And one of the things that we were thinking about based on what we heard from you all, what we know about the city and combining all of that, the neighborhood associations are really key. You all um, commented a lot about neighborhood organizations. We're talking about supporting and empowering existing and new neighborhood associations. It might mean to do the 
um, connections physically, socially, and culturally that we are making investments inside of and in between neighborhoods when we're thinking about transportation. That's the inter and intra neighborhood in terms of choices uh, of transportation. So you can um, have more freedom of movement, maybe moving in a more safe manner. Um, another thing might have to do with providing the incentives for neighborhood residents who have local knowledge to do smaller development or incremental development. Maybe they're um, doing infill or putting in new buildings in existing neighborhoods. Maybe they're just doing overall redevelopment. Maybe we're talking about maintenance, but this is more neighborhood focused and neighborhood resident focused when we're talking about development and investment in our neighborhoods. Um, another one has to do with um, displacement proofing and the policy agenda for neighborhoods. Bill, do you want to chat about this a bit? If I can find my unmute button, I'd be uh, be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, having physically, socially, and culturally connected city at the neighborhood level may mean, um, and sorry, which one specifically? Chat about the displacement proofing. Yeah, so displacement proofing is an idea that came out of uh, an organization called Strong Towns. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that, but there are things that can be done um, in terms of a policy agenda uh, to help limit or mitigate uh, some of the impacts of displacement from investment uh, in uh, particular neighborhoods uh, that often ends up with displacement. So as an example, um, providing uh, more opportunity for uh, investment from, from residents in the neighborhood itself and to keep that wealth in the neighborhood as opposed to uh, you know, large developers or large development coming in and changing the built environment significantly. It's more of an incremental step uh, that is accomplished by people living in the neighborhood who are uh, aware of um, the needs of the neighborhood. And so um, generally speaking, that's the idea. And there are specific policies uh, that can be uh, looked at and enacted. Thanks, Bill. So I know that was a um, displacement, equity. Those are big things that affect neighborhoods. And I, I've seen some comments in the chat about that. I need to think about it at the neighborhood level. So that's an idea that you might wanna consider. Another one has to do with getting more people to come to neighborhoods to visit them so that we can connect with one another. And maybe that means that you're connecting at the neighborhood level, but it could be some people coming from other neighborhoods to visit your neighborhood. There are also other ideas. We see so far, most of you are giving a thumbs up. We've got some question marks. We've got a thumbs down. This question, like all the rest of them that you're going to see are set up the same. You're going to be seeing some things that you can thumbs up, thumbs down. Then we're going to go into voting for you to tell us which of the three you like, and then we're gonna get into what you wanna do about it. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide. I know some of you are voting, but just hit that blue button and you'll catch me. So which three are most important for connectivity at the neighborhood level? And again, we're talking about physically, socially, and culturally. We've got the neighborhood associations. We've got investments in all modes of transportation. We can have incentives for neighborhood residents. We can do the displacement proofing agenda that Bill outlined, really focused on neighborhood residents. And then there's others. And you'll have an opportunity soon to let us know what your other is and what you wanna do about that, as well as the other four on screen right now. We have 59 people here. Almost half of you are voting. And we've got that investment in all modes of transportation followed by displacement proofing and neighborhood associations as your top three, but incentives for neighborhood residents is creeping up to the neighborhood associations. And some of you all um, are adding in the chat. And so we've got some comments in the chat that are for the transportation options mm -hmm. and transportation and neighborhood associations in the chat. And so we'll grab those out of the chat and make sure they show up in the Mentimeter. And 33 of you all are voting. I know some of you are also voting in the chat. 
give you an, another five seconds to do that. Okay, it looks like we got a little, well, displacement, just proofing and agenda and the transportation are still the top two, followed by everything but other. We've got some good, good comments in the chat as well. And again, if any of you wanna speak, let us know, raise your hand and we'll unmute you or, or allow you to unmute and uh, what'd you say? Okay. I see one here. Oh, go ahead, before I move this, go ahead, Imani. I'm allowing you to talk. You should be able to unmute now. Okay. Um, I wanted to piggyback off of an earlier comment about displacement. Um, even though you may have some investment uh, in the community, there's something that's called an opportunity zone. Mm -hmm. And what an opportunity zone does is that it allows outside investors to get tax credits for investing in a community. And usually when that happens, uh, most of the revenue goes back out of the community and the residents basically wind up with minimum wage jobs. So I really wanna be emphatic about um, being mindful and being um, critical of the use of opportunity zones in marginalized communities. Thank you, Imani. And I see Susanna has her hand up as well. One second. Oh, Susanna, I'm getting an error that says you're using an older version of Zoom and I can't allow you to unmute. <laughs> so I've never seen that one before. Uh, maybe you could put your comment in the chat for us. Well, that is that, Susanna. Hopefully, Susanna, you'll be able to chat to us. While that's happening, here are some examples of moves to create connectivity at the neighborhood level. Over the years, we've done corridor improvements by neighborhood or by businesses, and we have done that in a, like through a what you might call a business improvement district or a neighborhood improvement district. Those are groups that have um, leadership in them, and they have a defined list of improvements that they want to see in that particular corridor. For example, we have um, I think there's one for Prospect, there's one for 63rd Street, we have one downtown, there's one for Main Street, and so you start to see different improvements in those neighborhoods and along particular streets because of that organization, because of those, um, those districts. We also do planning for parks for improved maintenance and uh, more. The Parks and Rec Department um, received a grant, and it's all about focusing on the zip codes in Kansas City that have the lowest life expectancy and also poor health outcomes. All of that is called LifeX. And so they've been doing what they call park-centric plans, which are smaller scale park plans that neighborhoods have developed for what they need in their park. And then there is a district around that that is supposed to help maintain those park improvements. We also have historic districts like Santa Fe and many others. We do design guidelines. We have trails and bike paths and plans for those things and many other things. Those help to create connectivity from a physical, cultural, and maybe social way. Those are some examples. But as with the other question, we want to know from you all, from the things that were priorities to you all in the earlier conversation, how do you want to go about making your priority happen? Again, when you respond to this, please let us know which of these things um, on the left that you're thinking about. So if it's neighborhood associations, again, right, neighborhood associations and let us know how you wanna tackle that. If it's the incentives or the displacement proofing, events in neighborhoods, let us know how you want to do that. But be sure that you indicate which of those that you're focusing on. We've got the first one on screen. which is transportation. We've got um, non-car options available for all. It's cheaper and cleaner. We've got more advocates um, for each area of downtown, but I'd also like to, to sit on some type of a bus transportation committee because of the experience this person has. 
there's a couple of hands up, I think, Jay. Uh, we have Imani and Susanna still have their hand up. I don't know if they uh, wanted to talk again or just had it up from earlier. So I see Susanna lowered her hand. Uh, Imani, I think you're able to unmute if you want to talk again. Yes, I do. Um, I made a comment in the chat uh, that says statistics show that the majority of job creation comes from small businesses. Mm -hmm. We need more investment in our residents, uh, much like the FAS. SAFE project that helps support um, entrepreneurs and small business owners. Um, many of the issues like food deserts and housing insecurity result from poverty. And if we could address uh, the poverty uh, that exists in our neighborhoods, we could really improve the uh, infrastructure and the quality of life for people living in there. Very nice. Thank you, Thank Monty. You, Monty. Uh, I see Nancy has her hand up as well. I will. Oh, I get the same message. Apparently, uh, Zoom has must have made an update because it, Nancy it says that you're also using an older version of Zoom, and I can't unmute you. Well, there's always something new with this stuff. We always get something new each meeting. So Nancy, if you could put your comment in the chat, we'd love to hear your feedback. But I can't uh, unmute you right now. Uh, Janelle has her hand up as well. I will allow you to talk, Janelle. You should be able to unmute yourself now. So piggyback on Imani's comments, um, I believe that uh, when we focus on large developments which don't serve neighborhoods and serve more tourist attraction options like the big Lowe's Hotel downtown, that we aren't necessarily serving our Kansas City community the best. And I believe that that sort of investment tax incentive tax abase, abatement tools should be offered to small businesses who don't have development lawyers who are able to fill out this paperwork and, um, and vie for these incentives. So we need to have maybe a collaborative office in Kansas City that helps small businesses do almost the same work as a development lawyer would for these large developers. Thank you, Janelle. That's like smaller scale business assistance for development. Yeah, to some degree, of course, it needs to be much more like holistically comprehensive in that it needs to be similar looking to packages that are given to large developers like tax abatements hmm. and, um, and tax incentives and um, building improvement incentives, historical tax credits. It's like a whole package kind mm -hmm. of looking um, a comprehensive. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. And beyond the business side, there's some comments on screen about neighborhoods, neighborhood associations, to represent neighborhoods being um, badly needed. There's some comments here about transportation, more BRT. There was a comment earlier about really liking the LifeX program. We've got the incentives for neighborhood residents creating the environment for investment. And that's Janelle's comment. Imani's about the statistics, job creation, small businesses. Some of the others had to do with, you know, we've got food security, no more food deserts. Um, another other has to do with business improvement districts. They do great things if they're allowed, or excuse me, if they're involved. Um, we've got a comment here about pocket parks and some others. Because of time, we're gonna pass it to the next topic. You guys, from what I can tell, there are some really great ideas here and you guys are doing a great job of sharing what it is that you want us to focus on in relationship to the topic. That's really important that we know where your comments go. And we're also grabbing what you put into the chat. So with that, Jay, I'm gonna give this over to you to talk about community assets. Excellent, thanks, Travis. Um, and when we say community assets, sometimes these are referred to as amenity, amenities as well. Uh, we've talked about amenities uh, in this presentation and assets, and it's something that uh, several of you have noted uh, in the strong and desirable neighborhoods as being important and in the chat. 
Um, and so when we're talking about these assets, they could be uh, public assets, they could be private assets, um, public assets like uh, parks, uh, open space, uh, private assets such as uh, individual types of businesses, grocery stores, we've heard about food deserts here, uh, healthcare. Uh, so all those different types of assets that help strengthen a, a, a neighborhood and a community. So when we're talking about having numerous community assets in each neighborhood, uh, we may need to think about how do we define those assets and then identifying them, uh, mapping them where they are, where they aren't, identifying those gaps, uh, and then helping to market and support uh, what's needed to uh, fill in those gaps. Uh, it might mean we need to develop some context sensitive uh, guidelines uh, for neighborhood informed amenities. So we're getting the right types of amenities in the right neighborhoods uh, where those neighborhoods want those amenities. Um, it may be that we need to uh, invest in public uh, funding for additional amenities, uh, recreational activities, public art, open spaces and neighborhoods, again, based on those gaps uh, and that mapping. Uh, and what the residents are interested in in those neighborhoods. And uh, it also might uh, mean that we need to balance uh, the introduction of those assets in neighborhoods because certain types of assets, very high high volume museums or, or other spaces can create negatives. They can create issues with uh, traffic, with uh, growth, with um, displacement, again, is something we talked about a lot in this meeting, uh, and then just maintaining that community identity. So how do we balance introducing uh, new assets, different assets, and, and maintaining uh, the current fabric of that neighborhood. So um, with that in mind, uh, we have our mentee poll here as well. Uh, so if you all could identify what you think are those three most important factors for creating uh, numerous community assets. Uh, again, that might be defining those assets, what are they, mapping them, identifying where they are, where they're not, supporting them with marketing, uh, efforts might mean those context specific neighborhood recommendations, uh, introducing the assets based on the, the gaps, the context instead of being residents desires, uh, also paying attention to, to how we balance uh, the potential benefits uh, and challenges that adding yes, assets to neighborhoods might create uh, or other. Uh, and again, if you have other, feel free to put more comments in the chat, raise your hand um, and let us know what you think. See a lot of people uh, saying that introducing those assets based on the gaps that are identified in residents' desires is important, uh, and then also balancing uh, the potential disruptions that could occur with those. Also important looking at the context specific nature of those, neighborhood uh, informed uh, planning of those. So you have some good good uh, comments in the chat as well. And again, if any of you have any comments you'd like to, to speak, raise your hand and we can unmute you. Seems like uh, a lot of these things are important uh, across the board here. It looks like introducing those assets based on uh, what the neighborhoods say is really important and where we have gaps uh, looks like the most important thing to you all so far, followed by balancing that, that introduction of those assets with the potential challenges that come with it. Very good, all right, so as we look towards uh, this idea of uh, planning for new or introducing new assets, um, we wanted to ask uh, how we make sure this happens uh, in the right way. Um, so just some examples of what's been done, what's being done currently. We have a lot of uh, planning that's been done with this, um, such as the parks and, and public art master planning. We have the 1% for art. Uh, program uh, for public art. Um, the school district master plan, the Blueprint 2030 uh, has been ongoing. Uh, in other public sector master planning, uh, the area plans, um, the parks uh, and boulevard plans with their design guidelines for assets or, or amenities. Um, 
the private imp or, or the public improvement districts that we talked about earlier, Travis mentioned, uh, that are creating different uh, elements to uh, improve neighborhood uh, desirability, um, and then other other assets of that type, doing the planning, uh, committing some of the funding. So, how would you all? Uh, what are your comments on this, and um, how do we make sure that uh, your priority for these assets uh, is taken into account? And, and how do we best implement uh, and make this happen? I'll give you all a moment to type. Uh, those of you typing on your phone keyboard, apologies. Uh, I know that's no fun trying to type things out in the Minty Meter on your phone. But be sure, like the other ones, let us know what you're focusing on as you're telling us how to make your priority happen. Supporting long-term maintenance, yep, that's uh, it's very important. Um, building things without a plan for maintaining them is always a challenge. Uh, we know that a lot of these things come with a, a very long-term maintenance obligation. Yep, replicating successful uh, successes in the past, publicizing those things where we've had successes, um, loose park model. I know there's other uh, good examples uh, of that, uh, like um, over at Linwood and Prospect, the shopping center, some of those, uh, some of the CIDs that have improved areas. Introducing assets when funds are committed for public improvements to be Include ongoing funding for maintenance. Yep, absolutely. Same, similar comment. Got to make sure we can maintain what we build. Yeah, I'll give them a couple more minutes. Plans must be accompanied by the ethic to follow them. Plans not followed are pointless. Yep, absolutely. So giving some teeth to those plans, creating requirements so that they, they are followed uh, as projects get implemented both public or private side. Input, input from neighbors, investments, small businesses, encourage desired amenities, absolutely. Some great ideas here. So introducing assets based on residents' desires is great, but it needs to be linked with the marketing and support aspect of the effort or, or the effort will be a waste. You know, so providing some of that support uh, to help follow through with the residents' desires. See a comment about the abandoned school buildings uh, from KC uh, Public Schools, seeing how those can be reused uh, for public assets, uh, solar power generation, uh, battery on-site on battery storage for neighborhoods. Yeah, see that the, the, the idea of marketing communication, um, getting a few comments in here about that, making sure we're supporting these neighborhoods and, and creating assets through that marketing and communication side of things. Invest in improvements to support people rather than developers. So we have some good comments in the chat as well. I think. Uh, we're getting those uh, populated into the Mentimeter. Really great ideas here. I see some comments here about having uh, some amenities like grocery stores uh, be supported, uh, but then failing because of uh, low income in the area, unable to support that business. So maybe an ongoing uh, plan for ongoing support of these businesses uh, after we can't, we can't just say mission accomplished once they go into the neighborhood you need to make sure they continue to receive support, uh, um, these neighborhood assets. Making some great comments here. Recognize the assets are context-based, getting the right kind of assets in, in the neighborhood. Yep, prioritizing the assets based on uh, 
that neighborhood neighborhood input, neighborhood residents. Following the plans that that have been in place already, yep, for sure. Look into those area plans or other uh, smaller smaller area plans. Another comment related to maintenance, cleaning parks and streets, uh, and stop planning for a while. Focus on illegal camping, dumping, panhandling, kind of that maintenance uh, and operations side of things. Being sure we can maintain what we have before we put new in. Yeah, another comment about residents uh, input. Very good. Making sure the neighborhood residents uh, are are consulted in what they need and what's important to them when we're filling gaps. Excellent comments. Yep, there's a comment about making sure these large developments and major roads don't destabilize neighborhoods. So focusing on those challenges that could come with uh, new amenities coming into neighborhoods. Business incubators in the neighborhoods, small businesses. Public realm needs a determined focus on maintenance far more than additions. So yeah, that sort of fix it first mentality, make sure we're maintaining what we have before we expand new. good stuff lighting garbage making sure that we're maintaining what we have celebrate successes yep i think that's great focusing on what what has succeeded and making sure we're we're learning those lessons and applying them to other neighborhoods awesome so uh again if you're still writing feel free to keep writing uh in the interest of time we'll, we'll keep rolling uh keep moving and infrastructure and city services what we want to talk about next and specifically planning for infrastructure and city services. Um, we have our other um, uh, strategy session track of serviceability, which we do have that meeting coming up this Thursday, so two days from now, which we'll talk even more focused on infrastructure and city services. Uh, but in terms of livability, and especially for neighborhoods, uh, we want to talk about how to best plan for these serv city service improvements. Um, specifically look using community engagement uh, and data analysis to make decisions about infrastructure and city services. So uh, this might mean targeting our investments based on the adopted plans. There's been several comments about uh, following the plans that are adopted, making sure that the plans that are adopted have teeth so they get followed in the future. Um, enhancing resident engagement, really identifying prioritizing needs and desires with the neighborhood things like the citizen satisfaction survey, but also uh, that's somewhat reactive engagement, uh, even more proactive engagement, uh, upfront uh, visiting uh, within area plans or neighborhood plans, other things. Um, again, as, as we're talking through this, uh, I see some thumbs up in here. Make sure you give us our, our thumbs up or thumbs down or your question marks so then we can dive into a little bit more detail later. Um, Another thing this may mean is using more data-driven prioritization, um, city maintenance activities. Uh, maintenance is something you all mentioned quite a bit in the last one, uh, and making sure that we're we're using those those uh, tools such as asset management to make sure we're we're able to uh, uh, support the infrastructure we have, balancing new assets uh, or new maintenance activities on on infrastructure. Um, or say maintaining things we have versus a new investment, something you mentioned uh, on, you all mentioned on the last one as well, uh, this fix it first mentality of making sure we can afford to maintain what we have before we expand our infrastructure. Uh, and then also might mean incorporating more environmental friendly solutions. Uh, City is recently uh, or, or close to completing the climate protection uh, and a resiliency plan. Um, so incorporating those environmental friendly solutions and city sponsored activities uh, focus on sustainability. I see we got quite a few thumbs up, one thumb down, and uh, one question there. So let's move on to our mentee. So 
again, uh, which one of those, which, which one of these three prioritization techniques do you think would be best uh, for identifying the correct uh, infrastructure at a neighborhood level uh, and targeting that? Um, so targeting investments based on adopted plans, engaging residents, um, both reactively through things like the citizen satisfaction survey and proactively through public engagement efforts, just like this one that you're all involved with right now, uh, using data-driven prioritization maintenance activities. So mapping that, uh, using the, um, the techniques we have for asset management, making sure we're, we're maximizing the efficiency of the funding spent, balancing that maintenance, that asset ma management or the asset maintenance versus new investment. So the, again, that fix it first mentality, do we expand our infrastructure? Do we try to fix what we have, maintain that? Um, and then incorporating those environmentally friendly solutions. Looks like uh, enhanced resident engagement is, um, is important to you all along with balancing uh, what we have versus the new, the fix it first idea, making sure we can afford what we have versus uh, before we, we build new or, or at least bring those things into balance. Some good comments in the chat as well. Like Janelle's comment, data-driven response is only as good as the data. That's absolutely true. Something we get to work with on a daily basis when we're doing these planning exercises. And again, if any of you all have any comments that you'd like to say, please raise your hand. I see Nancy still has her hand up, but I think that may have been from earlier. I'm not sure if I can unmute you still, Nancy. I can try again. Nope, that's still the same issues with the error message. Very good feedback here. That looks like making sure we're striking the right balance between maintenance and, and new investment is really important along with uh, that enhanced resident engagement and that engagement can certainly uh, also help inform uh, what that balance is between maintenance and a new investment. Also thinking about incorporating more environmentally friendly solutions uh, and also using the data to create some data-driven prioritization uh, activities uh, to help maximize the how far the funding goes. All right, so on to the next kind of question here related to infrastructure. Um, in terms of how we can we can make your priority happen, um, just some examples of what the city does now uh, to kind of uh, give you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, area planning, looking at those infrastructure recommendations and area plans, uh, things like the KC Smart Sewer Plan. This is the, the combined sewer overflow system plus more uh, technology-driven, data-driven decision-making on the sewer system, uh, the sanitary sewer system, transportation planning uh, that's happened on a citywide, both, both in an area plan uh, context and citywide. Uh, and a lot of that, that planning uh, feeds right into the funding as well. Um, we have community engagement task forces like the Vision Zero Task Force, uh, other task forces uh, that relate to infrastructure. Uh, and then that public funding. So a lot of these things we I just mentioned are, are planning or engagement activities, but then how that relates to uh, public funding, the PIAC committee, the public improvements advisory committee uh, process that goes on every year to help allocate that funding, uh, the go bonds, the go bond process of uh, repairing sidewalks and other improvements uh, and the public engagement that happened with those things or other things. So as we think about these things, We'd love to hear your input again on how we make your priority happen. I see we have some good comments in the chat as well. Kind of a quiet group tonight. If you wanna, wanna speak, give us a breather, feel free to raise your hand. We'll let you all talk for a little bit. I see Carl's got his hand up. I'm going to 
allow you to unmute. You should be able to unmute now and talk. So when you ask that question, how do we make sure your priority happens? The idea of there being 50 people in this room or how many ever, they should be sought out. A criminal is sought out, apprehended, detained, interrogated, questioned, placed on trial, and then judged and then sentenced. Imagine if you did that with those individuals here who are taking their time to do the betterment of a whole city that has 500,000 people and there are less than 500 people that are engaged in this. Put those 500 people in a position to be acknowledged and empowered to carry out these missions instead of keeping them in silos. Granted, there are 50 people here, but we're still in a silo. Excellent. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for those comments. Renee, I see you have your hand up as well. I will allow you to unmute. And you can unmute and talk if you're ready. Thank you, Jay. As a result of the January high rise fire in New York where 17 people died of smoke inhalation while trying to evacuate the building, I learned that my high rise had stairway door locks that didn't fully close and no self-closing apartment doors. Both of these were major contributing factors in the New York fire, but these same factors in my building were overlooked during repeated inspections by our fire marshal. What can be done to have better inspections by the city and to ensure the fire marshal's office is adequately staffed. Does the fire department have a file, on, a plan on file for keeping multifamily buildings safe and learning how to fight the fires in those multifamily buildings? If not, can they use their downtime to survey these properties and develop a plan? Excellent, thank you, Renee, great point. Um, those inspections, that proactive inspection uh, of uh, infrastructure, uh, whether it's private or public, looking at those private buildings and making sure we're meeting fire code requirements. Uh, that's great input. Thank you, Renee. All right, some good comments coming in. I see KC has the most enhanced citizen engagement of any large city. Need to use that meaningful input and implement it. If you don't want citizen input or won't use it, then don't ask. Yes, we're asking for a lot of citizen input right now in this plan. We've had a lot of meetings and you all have been so generous with your time of coming and giving us such great feedback. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, we can put together a comprehensive plan that helps move that towards implementation. That's a great comment using an adopted plans again, targeting, targeting investment based on those adopted plans. Absolutely. Targeting is the only way to manage city budget investment for cities 320 square miles and only 500,000 people to pay for it. Yeah, so an idea of uh, how do we use our money? Uh, how is it best used when we have a lot of infrastructure for uh, maybe less, uh, less population, less tax pace base to pay for it. Steering committees ensure various departments are working in sync. Yeah, making sure we're working between the water department, parks department has jurisdiction over the parkway and boulevard system, public works department and other departments uh, involved in these infrastructure and city services decisions. Making, I see Rob has a, a good comment in the chat about whether or not the data points the city uses will be publicly available for audit. That could help data bias from forming. So that transparency uh, of the data used when we're doing data-driven efforts uh, and making sure the public knows what those data points are, where it's coming from and, and having access to that. And I see Lauren has her hand up as well. I will allow you to unmute if you wanna talk, if you're ready, Lauren. 
Great. Thank you so much for creating a forum for people to participate and uh, offer some initial feedback about these big topics. Just kind of reading into the chat and what I'm seeing so far, I think there is probably a huge opportunity after this engagement here, once there's some area focus areas to also bring in enhanced, like you said, resident engagement. And I think people from what I'm seeing are craving more participation in how these decisions are actually made. And so, you know, I've been sharing different options that are being used around the country, like participatory budgeting or citizens panels, citizen assemblies. These are all ways where communities are making really powerful changes uh, in deciding actually on some of these specific things, how the budgets are spent and getting into the details of how the decisions are actually implemented and grappling with the trade-offs, which I think takes some pressure actually off of electeds, but also works in conjunction with leaders. So I think that there's some deeper thought about how people can be involved in these decisions uh, and what participation can look like. And I'm really excited about that conversation as well. Excellent. Thanks, Lauren. Some great comments. I think kind of mirror what Carl said about getting getting people really involved uh, in, in that decision making, not just in the comprehensive planning process, but ongoing throughout budgeting processes and other processes. Thank you for that comment. I see Jonesy has her hand up as well. I'll unmute you to talk. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Uh, I, I feel the need to stand up for all the people who aren't here and all the people who want the city to be better without them having to invest in a bunch of community meetings. Um, just basically saying that we do, like Carl was noting, just by being here, we're having an outsized influence compared to our other neighbors. A lot of people can't be here. They can't be here in the middle of the day. They can't show up for, you know, they can't commit to community advisory committees and stuff like that. So I would suggest that one, we recognize that people shouldn't have to be involved at this level in order for the city to work for them, but also perhaps to have processes for people like us who show up at things like this to do a better job of like talking in our communities. I think there's just I think that you guys do an incredibly good job of doing community outreach, but you can only do so much. And I think we need to be honest about the limitations of that. And as just like citizens who are being engaged, I think we need to be more honest and accountable to ourselves and what we can do better to better represent our communities and not just ourselves. Excellent. Thank you. That's uh, great comments. And as we pointed out at the very beginning of the meeting, we know there's a lot of meetings that we've had, uh, both related to this project and others. Um, so I think that's some great comments. And, and again, just appreciate you all donating your time and being involved and helping us work through these, these, these issues. Um, great comments from all. I'm going to pass it over to Bill, uh, talk about housing affordability, quality, and diversity. Thanks, Jake. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks again for your participation today. My name is Bill Michael, and I am also with uh, WSP. So moving on uh, to uh, housing affordability, quality, and diversity, uh, this may mean uh, developing permanent funding sources for affordable housing development, leveraging existing public infrastructure to support home development, uh, the idea behind that being, uh, if there is not a need for new infrastructure, uh, there's not a need to maintain it. You're also uh, utilizing the existing infrastructure to a greater degree, avoiding uh, connection fees and these types of things that come along with new infrastructure associated with new development, uh, establishing more public-private partnerships to build housing. Uh, incentivizing more housing rehabilitation than new construction, uh, similar in uh, in in idea to the second bullet, um, but uh, looking a bit more at uh, utilizing existing structures as well as infrastructure, uh, requiring strong affordable housing percentages and targeted development areas. Uh, this will come up uh, later in the next topic as well. There's a number of tools in the toolbox uh, and particularly the zoning and land use toolbox that can be used for uh, that particular bullet. Uh, promoting development of small lot housing and unique housing types. 
Um, this came up in, earlier uh, when I was talking about uh, displacement proofing and, and incremental development and uh, em empowering neighborhood residents as opposed to uh, some of the larger developments that occur. Uh, if you're familiar with Daniel Paralek's uh, work on missing middle housing, um, the idea of uh, house scale or neighborhood scale uh, buildings with multiple units, um, which are compatible in scale and form with uh, detached single family housing uh, located in, in walkable neighborhoods and, and uh, offering that full portfolio of housing types, whether it's uh, single family duplex, stacked fourplexes, courtyard um, developments, that uh, all of those uh, being included in that conversation. Uh, creating culturally responsive housing options, uh, a little bit of an ex explanation here, um, a, a good example uh, is, is health outcomes, for example, that's uh, been in the news as it's related to the pandemic recently. Uh, refugees, immigrants, people of color experience disproportionate poor health outcomes, uh, cultural differences in how families cook, eat, uh, just live in general in their homes can be partly responsible for some of these health disparities understanding and responding to these cultural differences through housing types that support various ways uh, of living um, is a, uh, you know, a, a rough example of uh, culturally sensitive uh, housing. Uh, adaptive reuse of existing developed and underdeveloped property. I think someone mentioned earlier uh, in the chat, uh, you know, that there are um, opportunities uh, for um, vacant buildings, underdeveloped property uh, in the neighborhood. And uh, I've got uh, other on here as well. So um, got some thumbs up and, and moving on. Uh, which three approaches to housing are most important. Uh, so please use the, uh, the mentee to, to enter some responses here. Got kind of a few answers starting to come in now. Again, which three approaches to housing are most important when thinking about uh, this particular section of the, the presentation, improved housing affordability, quality, and diversity. Got a lot of responses around incentivizing more housing rehab than new construction, as well as adaptive reuse of existing and underdeveloped property. Uh, our participants see a lot of opportunity there, as well as promoting development small lot and unique housing types plus culturally responsive options. Also some interest in strong affordable housing percentages and targeted areas, whether that is through um, various uh, tools, as I mentioned in the toolbox, whether if it's inclusive zoning or, or other types of land use methods. Decisions should be data driven based on poverty levels and blight. I'm trying to keep an eye on the, the chat at the same time here. Still got a few trickling in. Adaptive reuse and incentivizing more housing rehab than new construction. Yeah, the increasing uh, aging population uh, is something that uh, is in the chat. Uh, need housing for seniors who don't need financial assistance. It looks like our responses have slowed, so uh, I think we can move on. Uh, examples of moves to develop affordable quality and diverse housing, and, and I would invite uh, Jay and Therese to jump in here too if uh, you have anything to add. Um, there are funding sources that uh, have been identified and utilized in this space, uh, incentives and requirements, set-asides, uh, zoning changes uh, have occurred, community engagement, uh, someone mentioned this earlier, 
um, tasks for task forces um, related to affordable uh, housing and rehabilitation assistance uh, and others. So comments, uh, please provide comments uh, around this conversation uh, so that we can get those recorded and, and dig into those as we move forward with the planning process. So housing affordability, quality and diversity, again, permanent funding sources, leveraging existing public infrastructure, more public-private partnerships, incentivizing more housing rehab. And we got a few uh, starting to pop up. Uh, again, from the, uh, from the chat previously, uh, need some housing for seniors who don't need financial assistance, but who don't have $4,000 per month for senior housing. Um, assisted living, uh, and nursing, and that sort of thing is, is a, a big barrier for, for some folks. Uh, in the next 20 years, it will be more important than ever to rebuild Kansas City in a healthy, equitable way. Renovation of existing buildings offers the quickest and most effective way to renew and to transform our city. We have an immense stock, uh, big opportunities uh, in some areas to utilize that existing, uh, existing structures. policy that encourages investment and incentives for rehabbing existing structures. Again, a lot of uh, interest around uh, utilizing the existing structures. And then there's the concern about uh, investment uh, causing uh, a rise in cost uh, for those who have been there for a significant period of time. And this goes back to the conversation we had uh, I can't remember if it was Travis or Jay talking about uh, displacement, uh, and this is uh, something, of course, that um, you know uh, we are all familiar with, and and uh, looking at strategies to to mitigate that. Um, okay, moving on to the next topic: eliminating disparities. Eliminating disparities may mean uh, ensuring prosperity for all. And I realize that's a very broad uh, statement that could mean uh, many things, but uh, sort of priming the, the pump for our discussion here, uh, avoiding displacement. We've talked a lot about that. Ensuring all neighborhoods have access to an education on basic city resources and processes. Um, and I've got uh, PIAC on here. Uh, Public Improvements Advisory Committee, uh, it's a uh, City of Kansas City committee, um, and uh, need-based decision-making, equitably distributing resources, financial and otherwise, and thinking about uh, new ways uh, that that can be accomplished, rethinking the city's budget allocations, that uh, also uh, refers back up to the previous bullet point about equitably distributing resources, ensuring diverse leadership at all levels of dis decision making, more equitable public health outcomes. Uh, we talked about that in a fairly targeted context uh, just a few minutes ago with the culturally sensitive housing and and uh, so again more equitable public health outcomes and access to housing jobs education and services. So moving forward, which three approaches to eliminating disparities are most important? We've already got uh, some folks jumping in here. We've got a comment in here. Uh, Choice Neighborhoods Initiatives offers a reasonable model community land trusts or another public-private housing initiatives. Yeah, and Bill, I think that was a, a, a comment uh, from Mr. Williams, planning director related to the question uh, that 
Marley had about public private partnerships uh, ah. for affordable housing. Uh, two examples uh, in the in the area. Thanks for the clarification there, and thanks for your comment, Director Williams. And, and th thanks everybody for participating. And again, I think those are just some examples. I think it's even expanding our universe when we say public and private. I saw the comment and about understanding how does um, funding and, and health and public health funding help. And so I think creating some new nexuses, even with existing public agencies, there's lots of conversations about public health and planning and housing. So I think it's leveraging different public partnerships as well as engaging uh, private groups um, and the not-for-profit community and folks that manage some um, patient capital in terms of investing in housing where they understand that their payoffs are numbers of years down the road. Thank you, Director Williams. Uh, let's see, neighborhood access to and educational and city resources processes uh, can facilitate uh, a number of positive outcomes that uh, has captured the most interest so far and then uh, really a pretty even distribution on this one. Diverse leadership at all levels of decision-making, more equitable public health outcomes and access to housing jobs, rethinking the city's budget allocations. And I think we're still getting a few trickling in, but slowing down here. This is great to, to see this kind of distribution across the board. I think it probably signals that this is uh, such an important issue that we're really gonna need to tackle it from a lot of different angles. and and looking at all these things as, as important aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, these are some examples, but, uh, you know, considering, um, you know, in all of the above strategy uh, and, and, but, you know, in figuring out how to prioritize those is the challenge. Uh, so examples of moves to eliminate disparities. Um, so special districts are, are one tool in the toolbox related to energy efficiency, job training and employment, parks maintenance, um, taxes. I saw some comments uh, in the, uh, the chat box related to tax policy earlier. So I know that is top of mind for some folks, um, programs and plans. Uh, so housing set asides, homeowner assistance, renter assistance, uh, property maintenance programs, health outcomes, And again, these comments are extremely important. Uh, we really value the input here. It helps us uh, and helps calibrate uh, the direction uh, of the additional uh, digging that we are doing uh, after these sessions. So uh, again, these are, are extremely important. So please put those in the, in the comment box, capital gains tax, needs-based response. If, again, if any of you want to, would like to speak, please raise your hand and we can uh, allow you to unmute and we'd love to hear your comments. I remember uh, earlier in the chat, someone was talking about um, asset mapping and trying to understand where gaps are and um, filling those gaps based on neighborhood uh, input. Um, stipend neighborhoods. Ah, I see stipend for neighborhoods. Um, working with neighborhood schools. Diversity can be solely cosmetic and not based on diversity of thought. I think Imani has her hand up. All right, Imani, you should be able to unmute now. Hi, um, I have a real concern. Uh, someone mentioned uh, that energy efficiency is uh, focused on certain areas. Uh, I have a real concern that low income people, especially those people living in housing developments, uh, will have an undue burden supporting the existing fossil fuel industry once the more affluent people uh, are able to get solar panels. Um, as that population of people, customers decreases, the utility companies are just going to raise their rates if they are not uh, making the transition over to renewable energy. So not only can uh, low income people not afford to put solar panels uh, on their homes, there are certain restrictions uh, that prevent them from doing so. 
um, people who live in housing projects uh, won't be able to uh, get uh, charging stations for um, electric vehicles if they're able to purchase them, if they can get a used one. And they'll also be last in line to be able to benefit from uh, the energy independence that could come from having solar panels uh, on the housing project. Excellent. Thanks, Imani. Yeah, and thank I see you. we are just one minute from the end of our meeting. Um, so if you're still typing, this is a really important uh, part of the comprehensive planning effort. So please keep typing. Uh, you'll still be able to enter your comments in the Mentimeter app uh, once we move on. So finish uh, what you're typing uh, and, and, and get all your feedback in there. I think uh, we're gonna have some closing comments in a minute. Uh, thank you everyone for your comments and, and uh, yeah, just that, that last one alone, very poignant, uh, critical issue in this period of transition between uh, fossil fuel and, and uh, renewable energy. So um, I think we can pass it over to uh, Mr. Elliott for some closing comments. We just uh, want to appreciate everybody for providing their time with us this evening. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody mentioned it or not, but at about 325 this afternoon, they kicked most of City Hall staff out of City Hall. So we also want to appreciate uh, the assistance that our consultant team did for us. They did a really good job putting this on, but they could not have done this without the engagement that uh, our community provided through this. So with me saying that, if you have additional things that you would like to provide in this process, please feel free to reach out uh, to, via the city's webpage for this project or contact staff directly. We'll make sure it's in there. We do have future meetings coming on. Uh, I won't belabor it anymore. We really appreciate your feedback. Anything you can do to help us get more people involved. Uh, we appreciate that. And with that, I bid everybody good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.